Hello and welcome, and in this video I'm going to be starting a series on how to rightly divide the word of truth, and I'm just going to be working on uh, a small handful of, of videos to go through this. And the first topic that I want to deal with is how to resolve contradictions in the Bible. So when it seems like the Bible's saying one thing, and then it seems like the Bible's saying something else, it's how you wrestle those two things and, and bring those together. Now, just as a side note, this, this video is generally intended for people that are already Christian. Um, it's not intended to be an apologetic series for people that, that reject the Bible. That's not really the purpose of this series. So we're going to look at how to understand the Bible, what are different um, methods that you can use to help you uh, resolve these contradictions so that the Bible starts to actually make sense. Now, I apologise if you can hear a bit of background noise. I think the washing machine's going on in the background, but it should be calming uh, very soon. And to introduce this series, we, we need to establish what, what is dividing the word of truth. What exactly does that mean? And, and this comes from 2 Timothy 2.15. It says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, which you can interpret as how you handle or manage your interpretation of the Bible. And why do we need to do this? Why do we need to divide the word of truth? Well, well let's look at an example. So in Galatians 2.16, it says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So Galatians is one of a few key verses in the Bible that say we're justified by faith, we're not justified by works, with, with salvation obviously being the context there. But then you have this uh, passage in James chapter 2, and uh, it says in, in verse 24 particularly, it says, You see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. And when you read the entirety of the chapter, that the general theme there is that man needs to put his faith and his works together and to justify. So these are seemingly diametric statements that have obviously caused much division amongst Christians about how works tie in, or rather don't, with our salvation. And this is why we need to be able to divide the word of truth, so that we can understand what the truth really is. Because either it's by works and faith, or it's not by works and faith. It, obviously, it can only be one of the two. And so it's understanding why the Bible says both of those things, why James writes the way that he does, and why Paul to the Galatians writes the uh, way that he does. And so, in other words, what we need to understand is, why is Paul saying this while James is saying that? What What's going on there? So, that's obviously one very particular example. There's plenty of other examples in the Bible where we need to understand about dividing the word of truth. And so, that's uh, sort of what this series will, will look into. We'll focus on these seeming contradictions in the first video. So, to make it as simple as I can, I'm, I'm going to divide each video into a series of rules. And so the first rule that I want to give you for how to resolve contradictions in the Bible is to go with the majority of scriptures and then re-examine what you believe about the minority. So I'm, I'm not saying to discard minority passengers. I'm not suggesting that you, you, you know, pretend they don't exist. I'm saying that you should reinterpret those minority passages around what we understand from the majority. So going with the James and Galatians example. So in James we read in, in chapter 2 that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. So we are justified by works. But that's one little passage out of the multitude of other parts of the Bible where it's by faith not of works. So all of these writings like Romans 3.20 by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. Um, and then we have Romans 3.28 therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Uh, deeds just being a, a synonym for works. Uh, the Galatians uh, we read in the previous slide. And then Galatians 3.11, uh, no man is justified by the law. And you have Galatians 5.4, whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. And so we have all of these passages that say we're not justified by works. So let's reinterpret what we believe about James 2 saying that we are justified by works. And so James 2 is obviously a complicated passage to understand, particularly if you don't know the Bible very well. Uh, we absolutely need to be able to explain and interpret it. We can't just pretend 
mind it doesn't exist or dismiss it as less important. But if you read the entirety of the New Testament, it's pretty overwhelmingly clear that we are justified by faith, which is in opposition to works. And in addition to the verses quoted, which mention justification specifically, there are dozens of other verses that we could turn to about how works are not required for salvation. So, you know, the fact that Jesus frequently said, whosoever believeth in me throughout John's gospel, which is intentionally written to tell you how to have eternal life. Um, we see quotes from the Old Testament, like how it said, David is, uh, blessed is the man uh, unto whom God imputes righteousness without works, which is then quoted by Paul in Romans to re-emphasize it. You know, Ephesians states that we're saved by grace through faith and not of works, specifically because it is the gift of God. And so being a, a gift, it, it cannot be justified by working for it. And so go with the overwhelming, indisputable evidence that works are not a part of this salvation unto eternal life. And then let's re-examine uh, what we believe about James 2. And this will become apparent as, as the video and the series progresses. And this leads me on to uh, rule number two. Go with clear statements and passages rather than unclear ones particularly when it's in relation to the subject matter, if possible. So I'll give you an example of this in practice. So for an example on this, we have, uh, if you're familiar with Genesis 6, it talks about the sons of God. Um, so I've just sh shown two of the verses on there. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And Again, if you're familiar with Genesis 6, you'll remember that there was giants in the earth and all that kind of thing, and then God had to bring the flood in. So there are two primary schools of thought that, that I'm aware of anyway, on who the sons of God are in this passage. So the first school of thought, which seems to be the more common one, is that they were fallen angels or, or demons who somehow... Uh, were able to breed with the daughters of, of men. So uh, ain't fallen angels were able to breed with, with mankind, essentially, and their offspring were giants. And because of the wickedness of the earth, that, that provoked God to, to flood the earth and to, to rid it of these abominations. Uh, the second school of thought is that they were the sons of Seth, um, a, synony a synonym for believers, who married non-believers, daughters of men, and this corrupted the morals of the sons of God, leading up to the violence that, that provoked God to flood the earth. And so, given that these two schools of thought, what are the clearest passages that, that can help us interpret this issue and which one of those is right? So given what the, the fallen angels school of thought believes, these are their proof texts, or at least some of them anyway. So in Job 1.6, it says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And Job 2.1 uh, reads very similar also. And Job 38 says, uh, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? This is, this is God speaking. Declare if you have understanding. Who laid the measures thereof if you know, or who has stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. And then the sons of Seth proof, te uh, proof text, if you like, that, that, that they're not fallen angels, they're actually uh, the sons of Seth, or, or you might say believers. These are their proof texts. So in Hebrews 1, particularly in verse 5, it says, for unto which of the angels said he, which is God, at any time, you are my son, this day have I begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And then it goes on to say uh, in, in verse 14, Are they, the angels, not all ministering spirits, sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? And uh, in John 1.12 it says, But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe. And so either the sons of God refers to fallen angels, or it refers to believers in that passage. It, it can't refer to both that would that would be a contradiction in terms of what's happening in that story and obviously both sides of the argument would have their own proof texts to justify this and so we have a contradiction here which one is the bible saying so just as an initial comparison before we get to specifics neither neither of these two verses on this side specifically prove 
that the sons of God actually does refer to angels. You you can only really make that assumption here, but you're making that without complete information because it, it doesn't absolutely prove that that's what they are. Whereas on this side, for these verses, we have proof text that specifically defines the sons of God as those who believe. It, it, it's defined right there for you. And we also have a passage that casts doubt on this entire notion that angels can be called a son of God. And actually it says they're ministers for those uh, that are heirs of salvation, which is actually those that believe, because the Bible says that, that we are heirs according to the promise and sons of God because we, we believe. And so uh, I, I haven't obviously put all of the proof text on there, but we have more clear passages to say that the sons of God are believers, the angels can't be called sons of God or, or haven't ever been called sons of God. We don't really have strong proof text that angels absolutely are the sons of God, especially not in relation to Genesis 6 particularly. Now getting into the specifics in Job 1.6, when it says that the sons of God presented themselves before the Lord and Satan was among them, it just because Satan was among the sons of God does not mean that they were angels because there are other proof texts in the Bible that Satan can stand among or alongside believers. So, for example, Zechariah 3, 1, it says, And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right side to resist him. So, Satan can be standing amongst men there. There's no particular reason that Satan can only stand among angels. And we have other verses in the Bible that talk about him, you know, roaming the earth like a roaring lion. He even says in Job that walking up and down in the earth. So uh, scripture seems to be more clear that Satan's actually on the earth rather than somewhere heavenly. And then in Job 38, when it talks about uh, where, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? So what, what the passage seems to be implying here is that God is saying to Job, you weren't there when I created the earth, and you, you can stretch that out to mean mankind generally. And so that's why they'll interpret the sons of God shouted for joy at this point, because human beings were not around yet. So it, it must refer to angels, because who else was there at the foundation of the earth? But Job 38 is actually part of the poetry section of the book and we'll look a bit more about that in later videos in this series about different types of books in the bible um, and although it does indeed make reference to the laying of the foundations of the earth when man, man was not around to see it we don't actually know for sure that angels were either and since this is poetry it shouldn't really be used as a proof text at the expense of more clear scriptures such as Hebrews 1 which is making more doctrinal clear statements and so go with the clear statements don't go with that that is less clear. For our second example let's revisit James versus Romans the, the contradiction that we brought up earlier. So James appears to say that faith cannot save if it does not have works so for example James 2.14 what does it profit my brethren though a man says he has faith and have not works can faith save him? Paul appears to say that faith will save even if there are no works. So, for example, Romans 4, 5, But to him that works not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So, on the one hand, we've got James saying, you know, faith cannot save if it does not have works. On the other hand, Paul says no faith will save even without works. So, which one do we go with? Well, the first thing that I want to point out here is that James is asking a hypothetical yes no question. It's a question. Whereas Paul is making an absolute declarative statement. Paul's not asking a question in Romans 4.5. James is asking a question in 2.14. So it would make more sense to go with the clear statement rather than the question. Moreover, although James does ask a closed question, he does use quite a drawn out answer. And while it does cast doubt on the faith of a man who has no works, he does not explicitly say that a man, if a man has no works, he won't be righteous before God. Okay. Now, yes, he says faith without works is dead, but he does not say faith without works can't save in the day of judgment. So don't put words in James's mouth that James hasn't actually said. Moreover, if you actually look at the context of what James and Paul are talking about in, in those two passages, and this will lead us on to the next rule, 
James is talking about working out your faith for the benefit of your brethren. So not to show, uh, not to exercise your faith with respect of persons for the rich over the poor. If you see a brother destitute, don't just say depart in peace, but do something useful to help. Whereas Romans is very specifically talking about righteousness being justified in right standing before God. But that's not really the theme of what James is talking about. So this is going to lead us on to the next rule. So rule number three, and this is absolutely crucial, is look carefully at the context or the subject matter of the opposing passages. And if you can, look for what I would call a key. And, and that is a passage that can help you unlock the puzzle to resolve the contradiction. So I'm going to show you how to check the context, first of all, and, and to look for this key. What is what is the key? And the key helps the whole thing to make much more sense. In fact, this is probably one of the most important rules throughout this entire series, is check the context and look for a key. So we were just checking James 2 and Romans 4. Let, let, let's have a, a further look into this. So uh, obviously I've not listed all the verses because there'd, there'd be too many to keep the video uh, short and sweet as I can. But I've just plucked out some important verses for the context. So in James chapter 2, verse 1 said, My brethren, have not faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. So don't have faith with respect of persons. And that's, you know, favouring rich over poor, for example. He then goes on to say in verse 14, what does it profit? Okay, if a man says he has faith but not works, can faith save him? What does it profit? And he gives an example of this. Verse 15, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food. Verse 16, and one of you say unto them, depart in peace, you are warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are need full to the body and he asks that question again what does it profit okay that's what that's the context of what james is asking whereas in romans 4 uh, so when it said in romans 4 5 but to him that works not but believes on him that justifies the ungodly his faith is counted for righteousness he goes on to say even as david also describes the blessedness of the man unto whom god imputes righteousness without works so then in summary the justification by works described in, described in james 2 is a reference in reference to how your faith can benefit your brethren okay so not having a faith which shows special respect to certain types of believers such as you know the rich as opposed to the poor and not leaving a brother or sister destitute just because you happen to have faith that god can intervene so you actually have to put your faith into practice for the profit of the brethren. Whereas the justification without works described in Romans 4 is in reference to your righteousness before God, so as to not have your sins imputed onto you. Okay. So moreover, so we've got the context. So the context in James is helping your brethren with your faith and so that it profits the brethren whereas in Romans 4 it's righteousness before God so the justification that Paul and James are talking about is not the same kind of justification and we'll, we'll understand a bit more about justification later in the series when we we look at terminology moreover then Romans 4 actually contains the key and this key is a key verse which will resolve this whole contradiction to help you bring these two passages together so that they are both consistent. So let's have a look at what the key is. So in James chapter 2 verse 21 it says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Romans 4 2 says, For if Abraham were justified by works, he has whereof to glory, but not before God. So Romans 4 2 is the key. This verse unlocks the solution to the whole puzzle for you. If Abraham were justified by works, Romans 4 2 says, which according to James 2 21 he was, he can glory, which means to receive public praise or honour or fame, so he can glory in those works, but watch this, not in front of God. It says not before God. So Abraham has glory in his works, but not before God. So I ask you then, if he is justified by works, who is he justified in front of? Because he can't glory before God in his works, but James 2 quite clearly says he's justified by his works. So who is he justified in front of? Well, if it's not God, then logically the only answer 
is before man. Abraham, if you read the Old Testament account of Abraham, he is a good example of a faithful believer from the Bible that we, the brethren, can learn from to help us. So we're the brethren, we're the seed of Abraham. And what's James talking about? Your faith and your works profiting your brethren. So we can learn from Abraham, grow in our own faith and confidence in God for the benefit of helping us do our works. So then, James 2 is then consistent with Romans 4. We are not justified by works before God for our righteousness unto salvation, but our works justify our faith for the benefit of the brethren, which is the very reason why James is telling us, show our faith by our works so that it profits the brethren. So Romans 4, 2 is the key, answers this whole conundrum. It, it solves the whole puzzle. Another example that we'll look at is conditional versus eternal security. So on the left side, we have eternal security, which is where we can't lose our eternal life versus conditional security, which is where we can lose eternal life. So both of these camps will have their own list of proof texts that they like to go to. So on the eternal security side, we have John 6, 39. And this is the Father's will, which has sent me that of all which he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. Uh, they'll also take you to John uh, chapter 10, verses 28 and 29. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them from out of my Father's hand. So that's the eternal security go-to passages. Uh, on the other side, we have the conditional security passages. And obviously, again, I'm not going to list them all, but just a couple for you. So they might take you to Hebrews 10.26, where it says, For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for a judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. Another passage they might take you to is John chapter 15, verse 6, where it says, If a man abides not in me, referring to Jesus, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burnt. So, again, what is the context of these two opposing arguments? What is the key for these passages? So let's, let's look at the eternal security go-tos first. So John 6 and John 10. In John 6 and 10... Jesus is very specifically talking about eternal life to groups of unsaved people. Um, the John uh, 10, 28, which is on the screen there, even includes the words eternal life in the statement. And in John 6, eternal life is mentioned in the very next verse in verse 40. Moreover, the context is that it's Jesus's responsibility to not lose those who the Father has given him that were given eternal life by Jesus. So the key go-to verses about eternal security here are in conversations where Jesus is very specifically talking about eternal life and salvation, and Jesus takes on the responsibility to hold on to us. He doesn't leave that with us. We cannot allow a doctrine that enables Jesus to fail or not fulfill what he said he would achieve. Okay? So now let's deal with the conditional security verses. So I, I gave two. Uh, one of the passages was Hebrews 10. So we'll look at that first. So when it says uh, the statement there remains no more sacrifice for sins, the conditional security camp will automatically interpret that to mean that Jesus' sacrifice is no longer effective for the offending person. So in other words, they will say that they lose their salvation. And this may be qualified by the very next verse that talks about them looking for a fearful judgment and a fiery indignation. OK, well, if you actually read the beginning of Hebrews 10, the context of Hebrews 10 is that the Old Testament sacrifices that had to be continually offered for sins, which included willful sins and sins of ignorance, whereas Jesus' sacrifice is once and for all. And that's why there remains no more sacrifices for sins. This statement, therefore, has nothing to do with whether you can lose eternal life that you've already got. That's not the subject matter, okay? The subject matter is that in the Old Testament, every time they sin, they would have to offer another sacrifice, and then another, and then another, and another, and it would just go on and on and on to keep dealing with the fact that they kept sinning. So Jesus is the final sacrifice, and we are sanctified according to that offering and there's some of the proof texts there such as uh, you know 1 to 3 and, and verse 10 was sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all and because it's once and for all 
there remains no more sacrifice for sins. That's the context of Hebrews 10. It's got nothing to do with whether eternal life can or cannot be lost. Now, when it when it then says the fire and indignation and the judgment, they will automatically assume that that's hellfire. But this is forcing a definition onto it that the writer of Hebrews could have just said if that's what he meant. If that meant hellfire, he could have just said, but a, a certain fearful looking for hell. But he didn't say that, okay? This is somewhat open to interpretation there. But the comparison from verse 27, if you carry on reading Hebrews, verse 28 gives you an example. And so it says, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. So the example that he gives in verse 28 to qualify the judgment in verse 27 is an earthly death. That's why there had to be multiple witnesses. It's not a spiritual death. Moreover, if you read on further in verse 30, it will say that the Lord shall judge his people. But logically, conditional security asserts that the fallen will no longer be God's person or God's child. So the context there is judging God's own people. So you cannot just automatically assume that that means hell, when he could have just said that if that's what he meant, and he gave an example of an earthly punishment. Then let's look at the other conditional security go-to verse that I mentioned, John fifteen six, that he's cast forth as a branch and uh, cast into fire. So uh, although this conditional security go-to verse is also in the same book, John's Gospel, where the eternal security go-to verses are found, the context has now changed considerably. So John 13 to 16 is, is the full context of, of this conversation. So it, it's too long for me to quote the entire context. So I'll just summarize the points here. So in John 15, Jesus is talking with his close disciples only. He's not preaching about eternal life to the unsafe. Now, having said that, conditional security advocates would claim that this is precisely because obviously the issue of losing salvation is for somebody that's already saved. It's not relevant to discuss that uh, with people who are not yet saved. It's only relevant to people who are already saved. But more crucially though, Jesus never mentions eternal life specifically as the context of this conversation. The branch is also a metaphor. So because he's using an, a, met a metaphor here, there's a wider room for interpretation as to what exactly it means to be a branch, what it means for a branch to be cut off and cast into the fire. So for example, a believer being chastised by being cut off from the earth dead, but still technically saved or otherwise even suffering some ill fate. So there's obviously room for interpretation as to what it means for a branch to be cast into the fire because a branch is a metaphor. You know, you're not literally a tree branch, right? But although it's quite crucial that Jesus never mentions eternal life specifically as the context of this conversation, you, you can understand why somebody would read it that way. Um, Jesus asserted that the disciples are branches in him, but if they don't abide, which is to continue or remain in him, they can be cast into the fire, essentially, which if it doesn't mean hellfire, obviously that's quite strong language if, if it just means an earthly punishment, as, as I might assert. So while the context of John 15 is not eternal life specifically, you can absolutely understand how this could be confusing or in contradiction to his statements earlier in John about losing nothing and not letting any be plucked from out of his hand. So th again, this is why we need the key. Fortunately, the key is contained in the aforementioned chapter 6 of John's Gospel. John 6 contains the key here. So in John 6, Jesus wraps up the conversation that he's having, and in between verses 64 to 71, it says, But there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believe not, and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come to me, except it were given unto him of my father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, 
being one of the twelve. So this is the key here. Notice that many of Jesus' disciples, this is not ordinary believers, this is disciples, and that's who he was talking to in chapter 15, right? So the stakes are higher now. They they walked no more with him in, in verse 66, apart from the twelve, obviously. So based on John 15, you might say that the disciples who walked no more with him, they're those who didn't abide in him. Okay, as the remaining uh, disciples were instructed to do. Notice how Jesus puts them in the category of believe not. Jesus knew from the beginning whom they were that believe not. And he says, but there are some of you that believe not. Why? Jesus knew from the beginning that they did, uh, did not believe. So Jesus already knew here that Judas was false. So we can conclude that Jesus already knows from the beginning those who do not abide. And they fall in the category of believe not. Since they don't believe, and Jesus already knew this about them, they did not lose salvation because they never had it. They believe not. That's how Jesus categorizes them. That's the only way you can make sense of those who don't abide in him. And this is consistent with eternal security because no man can come to Jesus except the Father gives him. And under that same condition in John 6 and 10, Jesus will lose nothing and not let any be plucked from out his hand. Those who walk no more with him, they were not given by the Father because this that promise doesn't apply to them. Otherwise, why didn't Jesus hold on to those? It's because they believe not. Jesus doesn't have to fulfill his obligations to them. They don't come under the category of believing and being saved. There's also a secondary key that you can also use in John that further qualifies this, and this is just a bit quicker. So John 3.18, he that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already. Why? Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So John 3.18 asserts that he that does not believe and is therefore condemned has not believed. So the prospect of somebody who used to believe onto eternal life, but no longer does believe is not offered here. Okay. Conditional security would have to artificially inject such a person into this text. So thanks to these keys, we can now know that those who fell from grace or fell away, or those who walk no more with him, or the branches that did not abide and were cut off, or those who left or did not continue in their first faith, are those who Jesus knew from the beginning, believe not, for they have not believed. And because they have not believed, you cannot say that they were ever saved. Now, yes, they were enlightened. Yes, they were partakers, as, as Hebrews 6 says. Yes, they were a branch. But no, they did not have salvation onto eternal life. Jesus was not obligated to keep them firmly in his hand because they didn't meet the criteria for Jesus to fulfill his obligations that whosoever believeth in him. Jesus doesn't owe them anything because they come under the category of believe not. He doesn't have to do anything for them. That's why he doesn't hold on to them. You see how once you've got the key, it all makes perfect sense. The last rule that I want to cover in this video, and, and this is not, not as important as the other issues, but um, there are some minor contradictory issues in the Bible that, that may only be resolved by secular knowledge outside of the Bible, but, but these are generally restricted to trivial matters or, you know, fairly unimportant things. So I'll, I'll show you a, an example of this in practice. So a really good example to, to show this is the hour that Jesus was crucified. So if you follow the narrative in Mark's gospel, it says they crucified him at the third hour, whereas in John's gospel, it's about the sixth hour. So, we, you know, which one is it? Okay. Well, uh, there is a difference between Hebrew and Roman measurement of time. So um, Hebrew time resets at sunset, whereas Roman time resets at midnight, which, you know, this would be a six hour difference if sunlight was exactly 12 hours. Having said that, Hebrews would count the hour since sunrise rather than sunset, as, as you would on a, you know, like a 12 hour clock. So since time could only be measured by a sundial rather than a clock, time was measured around the moving of the sun relative to sunrise rather than an exact time in a 24-hour day. They didn't have mechanical clocks, so time couldn't be calculated that accurately. Moreover, in John's narrative, it is only about the hour and minutes were not counted, which isn't really very exacting. Let's say that Jesus was crucified at sunrise. Well, you might think of an exact sunrise at about Six. I meant to say a.m. there. Sorry, I don't know what I've done there, but that meant to, meant to say 6 a.m. But throughout uh, the year, it may be earlier or later than that 
as per the seasons. So it wouldn't be unfeasible that his cru- crucifixion was perhaps some time after 6am. You know, not very exacting, maybe 7 or slightly nearer 8pm. But this was approximately three hours after the sun had risen that day. So because time was fairly approximate and there were two different measures of time, this is not necess- this is not really a huge problem. But nevertheless, the thing is, we don't know from the Bible itself that John was specifically using Roman time while Mark was using Hebrew time. That there's nothing in the Gospels that say, "Hey, I'm using this this time frame." This relies on secular knowledge and questionable sources, which, which may or may not be accurate. But uh, obviously, questions perhaps need to be considered about how this would affect the Bible's infallibility, but that, that would be too much of a, a topic for, to cover in this video. But overall, the exact hour that Jesus was crucified is, for the most part, a minor detail. It, it does not change the nature by which he died for us so as to take our sins away and our confidence in his accomplishment. This this can be explained, it's just that it can only be explained by secular knowledge and the fact that it's about thee, which, again, if you understand history and sundials, you, you can understand why they wouldn't have a watch about their arm, that they can accurately calculate an exact time in the day as you or I would. Okay. So that concludes uh, this first video. I hope that that's um, helped you. When I can get on to releasing the recording for the next video, we'll look at understanding the definition of words and using the Bible as its own dictionary. So uh, these rules have just been about uh, dealing with contradictions in the Bible. Um, and perhaps if you think there's something that I've missed, or if you have any further questions, by all means, pop something in the comments and I can have a look.